Razabani for IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. I'm delighted to have with me on Zoom today, my guy, my man, all the way from Las Vegas, New Zealand's finest, Mr. Kevin Barry. Kevin, it's been a very, very long time. How are we doing? Raz, it's been far too long, my brother. I miss you. Like thanks for having me on uh, on with you and and on with IFL, uh, mate. I've, I've I've missed being here with you. No, no, likewise, likewise, uh, Kev. Obviously, we know the boxing starting to kick off again. The heavyweight division is starting to explode. So I thought, who better to speak to uh, than Kevin Barry himself? But Kev, firstly, um, how was everything? How's the family? Uh, everyone well? Family are great. Uh, we're all healthy, keeping busy. Enjoyed the uh, Las Vegas summer. It's been it's been fantastic. In fact, it's been very very hot. I think this has been the hottest summer ever on record. So we're so we're now today our temperatures are dropping into the high nineties, and I think for the next probably six to eight weeks will be one of our nicest times of the year. You know, the temperatures in the 70s and 80s, low 90s. Nice time, nice time of the year to be here in Vegas. What was the highest it went to? Um, I remember seeing 116 at one stage, and uh, and I think we had three or four days in a row like that. It was brutal. You know, people's ACs were blowing out, and you know they were just o overworking, trying to cool the houses down. Um, wow. When it gets like that in the dry heat, it's uh, it's thank God we have pools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I've seen your pool as well. Um, Kev, how are the fighters in the gym? I know you obviously a couple of new additions. Obviously Joseph Goodall as well, the Australian. Um, I've obviously saw Umar Salimov, obviously, and Joe Smith. Looks like that's going to take place as well. But just give me a little rundown on on how the guys are doing in the gym. Well, you know, Joe Goodall's been a, been a new addition to our team. I've had Joe living in the house, uh, another Joe. Um, I've, I've had him living in the house now for the last three months. Um, his manager, Steve Scanlon, sent him over to me. So I think you're really going to like this guy. I think you'll have chemistry. I, I sort of did a little bit of research on him, but it wasn't until he actually got here and I started working with him, I saw the potential. Like this, it's a big kid, he's six foot five, 240, um, Commonwealth Games silver medalist, bet Effie Jagba in the amateurs, lost to Joe Joyce, uh, was a bronze medalist in, uh, uh, in the World Cup in 2017. Um, he lost to, you know, in the semi-final, he won three fights there and lost the semi-final on a split decision to Muhammad Russell. Um, the the, the three-time world champion. Um, so the kid has, he has good pedigree. He's seven and oh as a pro, six knockouts. Started his career, believe it or not, um, that with a, had a shoulder injury for the first two years. Why they ever let him fight with a shoulder injury, I'll never know. Had a couple of years off after that, thought about uh, not fighting anymore. And then came back this year, for the 25 fight pro in, in March uh, for the WBC Oceana title and stopped them in two rounds. And, and then he came over to me. So I've, I've had him working some good guys in the gym. He's got a big motor. He's, he's very happy to be here. He saw what we did with Joseph Parker living in the house, training two, three times a day. And he, he wanted some of it and he's making the most of every single day. So I think he's, he's definitely one of the uh, talents from down under. Um, I have a super middleweight, uh, Aslanbek Idigoff, who's ranked number four in the world with the WBO. He's been with me for the last uh, two and a half months. He looks to be um, fighting early November, possibly in Moscow. Uh, there's been a bit of talk about fights in the UK for him, but I'm thinking uh, right at the moment, I'm, I'm getting the... I'm seeing the best work that he's given me in the last couple of years. And I think that 2022 is going to be a very strong year for Aslan Beck. Um, uh, as you mentioned before, Umar Salamov is fighting Joe Smith for the WBO light heavyweight title. That fight's going to be sometime early uh uh, November, um, we, we sort of know the date, but I don't want to go and say it because it needs to be announced by the right people. Um, uh, look, it's a that's a very very good fight. 
Uh, it's a fight that we've waited for for a long time. You know, Salomov's uh, uh, 20, 26 and 1, 19 KOs, very strong, very powerful guy. Uh, big light heavyweight, six foot three and a half. And we all know about Joe Smith, uh, uh, very durable, hits extremely hard, very tough guy. And, you know, this being his first world title defense since his controversial decision over Maxine Vlasov, another fighter of ours. Um, we know he'll be, he'll be prepared. He's fighting at home in New York and it's, it's going to be a tough fight to win. Um, you know, as Vlasov saw, it was a tough fight to get a decision against an American fighting in America. So, you know, Salomov needs to actually put hands on Smith and, and knock him out. But Kev, that light heavyweight division is, is quite stacked here in the UK. Obviously, we've got people like Joshua Boatsy, Anthony Yards, the Lyndon Arthurs, etc. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, we know Joe Smith and, and obviously uh, Better Be Ever, obviously, are kind of at the top of that, that list at the moment. Uh, who, who would you say is the best light heavyweight? In the world, well, you know, obviously, Better Bev's the he, he's the name, isn't he? He, he? Doesn't have the the huge profile, um, but is well respected for his power and for, and for the big wins that he's had. So I, you know, and the fact that he's coming towards the end of his run, he's late. Uh, I, I want to say he's thirty seven. Um, he's he's got to be the, the the number one guy, uh, I believe, in that in that division. Look, you know, when you mentioned Boazzi before, like, you know, I was very keen to try and get uh, Maxime Blasov uh, in the ring with Boazzi. I thought it was a great test. They were looking to step Boazzi up. And I've, uh, you know, a couple of times I have offered uh, Maxime Blasov. And you know, everyone knows that, you know, Blasov's last fight was a, uh, it was an incredible fight with Joe Smith. It came down to the wire. A lot of people think Blasov won the fight. Uh, one, one stage in the 10th round, Vlasov nearly nearly stopped Joe Smith. So, you know, Vlasov's fought, um, ne he's never been stopped. He's fought at cruiserweight, he's fought at light heavyweight, he's fought at super middleweight, he's fought all the best guys in the in the division. And I and I thought that was a perfect test for Boatsy, but uh, I don't seem to have a lot of interest from their team. Obviously, Boatsy obviously was out not longer against uh, uh, Bolotniks, uh, where he obviously got to stop. I don't know if you managed to watch that fight. Yeah, I saw it. I thought he looked great. You know, I think he's improving all the time. And I just sort of thought, you know, they they want to line him up with a world title fight. Well, you know, this is the perfect guy to go through just to show that you are le a legitimate contender in, in the light heavyweight division. Absolutely. Um, Kev, over the next couple of months, it's a uh, heavyweight scene is going to be, you know, it's going to go a bit mad, I think. Uh, we're going it's to an exciting see. time. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're seven, eight days away now from the return of the unified champion, Anthony Joshua. A man you know very well. You've studied him for, obviously, Joseph Parker. Um, he's obviously taking on Alexander Usyk. Um, Kev, I know Evander Holyfield was one of the greatest cruiserweights ever that then moved up to heavyweight and became a dominant champion, not just win a... A, a, a belt but dominated the division at his time yes. as well. Five time heavyweight world champion. No one else has done it. Can people talk about Usyk sometimes in the same breath as Evander Holyfield? And they say, you know, Evander Holyfield is probably number one and Usyk could be number two or number three, greatest cruiserweights ever. But can Usyk replicate Evander Holyfield and dominate the heavyweight division? Look, I, I honestly believe that he can. And I think that this is, for me, this is one of the most exciting fights of the year. I, I said a couple of years ago um, that I thought Usyk was going to be a legitimate guy. He's obviously the most skillful fighter that Anthony Joshua has ever shared the ring with. This is a guy who's got an incredible boxing IQ. This is a guy who was the first cruiserweight ever to win all four straps in the cruiserweight division. Uh, when you look at his progression and his move up to the heavyweight ranks, let's remember on his way, he beat four undefeated champions in the cruiserweight division. Uh, you know, the Bredis and, and Gassiev and, and Glaukaki, 
Michael Hunter, you know, all really good, skillful, quality guys, and he, he beat them all. Um, a lot has been said about uh, his first two fights as a heavyweight. Um, we know the fight with Chaz Witherspoon was not his best performance, but he just put a bunch of weight on, and you know, and he, all of a sudden he's used to throwing a lot of punches, a lot of fast punches, and now with that extra size and muscle, his body hadn't really made the adjustment. Um, you know, fighting Chisora, at, you know, one of the toughest guys in the heavyweight division, he all but had Chisora out. Um, you know, you know, Chisora has been a handful for for a lot of guys. Um, but he, he won the fight comfortably. I think that this is going to, this style is a very difficult style for Anthony Joshua. And, and I think this will be a, a great test for him and his team. Look, he has a very smart team. There's no doubt about that. And they've always made the adjustments uh, to the styles of the fighters that they're fighting. But I look at, I look at this Usyk fight and it's been sitting there for the last couple of years. They could have, fought this fight a long time ago and I honestly believe that if it wasn't for the fact that Tyson Fury had to line up once again with Wilder I don't think we would have seen Joshua take this fight I think it's a style that's going to be very challenging for him a style that's going to be very uncomfortable for him and a style that's definitely going to test them at different times in the fight if you're if you're team Anthony Joshua what what goes through your head in terms of how you address Usyk in the ring? You know, with, there's a few pictures that have gone around of showing Anthony Joshua slim down and, and lost weight. We saw what his tactics were against Joseph Parker, against Ruiz too. He moved around a lot. He wasn't that vicious Anthony Joshua. We saw the early part of his career. Right. But for someone like Usyk, can he go toe-to-toe -to -toe and box with someone like Usyk? Or does he go in there, be, because he's the bigger guy, the taller guy, the heavier guy, and just go... Well, I'll, I'll punch, I'll punch straight through him. Well, I tell you what, I think there will be times in there where he will try and impose his size, strength and power on Usyk. But, you know, when we said before about Usyk being the most skillful fighter that Joshua has ever fought, you know, Joshua is also the most powerful, physically imposing fighter that Usyk has ever shared the ring with. So, you know, so both of them have their strengths. I think it was only sensible that, that Joshua was going, to, um, was going to lean down. He needs to be very mobile in this fight if he's, if he's going to be able to counter some of, the, uh, some of the movement and angles that Usyk is going to give him. I think it's very important, I, and I'm sure he's worked very hard on his fast feet drills. You know, he needs to be moving those feet uh, a lot faster. Um, I see Usyk, uh, we, we know that he, that he has that southpaw counter-punching style, but let's remember his whole career has been fighting orthodox fighters. You know, Joshua hasn't fought a lot of southpaw fighters, and this is not just a southpaw. This is one of the elite southpaws in the world. You know, this is a guy, as we mentioned before, has an incredible boxing IQ, has so much skill. And I think Joshua is really going to be tested here. I think we will see uh, early in the fight, there will be a, there will be a lot of rounds that, uh, that Joshua will be uh, very uncomfortable in. Um, later in the fight, maybe a little different, you know, when he has that superior size, superior height and reach advantage. But, you know, even talking about the reach, you know, he's got a four-inch reach on Usyk. Um, he had an eight-inch reach on Andy Ruiz, and yet Andy was still able to put hands on him. So, you know, I don't think the reach is going to be as, as, as big of a thing as people are making out. Does this fight go 12 rounds? Look, I, I really think it does. You know, we've never had any concern to question Usyk's chin in any fight. No one's ever said, oh, he's vulnerable for a pound, but sure. He's never, as I mentioned before, he's never fought anyone uh, with, the, with the size and power difference of Anthony Joshua. But yes, I honestly, I honestly believe so. I think this fight goes the, goes the rounds. I think there are, several, there, there are several key things in this fight. Obviously, fighting a southpaw and a counterpunch in southpaw feints are going to be, be very important for Joshua, uh, especially early in the fight. You know, throwing the feints, having a look and seeing the way Usyk is reacting. 
I think that uh, we, we saw in the Povetkin fight, Joshua use a really good jab to the body. I think a straight right hand to the body would be an important fight for him here. And, and you know, with Usyk's uh, angles and his uh, southpaw style, I think from the middle zone, the right uppercut that Joshua throws, and we know he's got a tremendous right uppercut, that could be a real danger weapon for Usyk. If I put, say, Kev, put your money down, you said it's going to go the full 12 <laughs> pounds, who's going to get their hands raised at the end? Well, I tell you what, my, my, my gut tells me that this fight is a much harder fight than what a lot of people think it is. Um, you know, I would not all be surprised if, uh, if Uzdek wins a lot of rounds and, and hangs on to get a decision. Interesting, interesting. Well, we're only uh, eight eight odd days away now, uh, Kev, so... so... Which, which I tell you what, let me just, Raz, let me add this. This is what makes me sort of, you know, shake my head a little bit that everyone's going on about Fury and 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 uh, and Joshua. You know, Tyson Fury's got a got a handful with with Wilder in fight three, and Joshua has got a handful with Usyk. You know, neither of these guys should be looking past the people in front of them at the moment because they're both in real fights. Um, I've I've seen so many stories with, you know, Joshua's promoter, Eddie Hearn, you know, talking about Fury, you know, having arguments with Fury. I think they need to be focusing, maybe because Usyk's not a shit talker and he's not, uh, he's not causing a lot of problems. He's just going about doing his work that maybe they're underestimating him a little bit. Maybe they look at the Chaz Witherspoon fights and they look at the Derek Chisora fights and they sort of think, I, you know, we'll, we've got too much firepower for this guy. Um, I just, you know, I, my, I just got a little feeling that uh, Usyk is going to be more difficult than what a lot of people think. And, and Kev, just to echo your words, uh, if you go back a, a couple of years when we would look talking about Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder for the undisputed title, <laughs> yeah. and then Joshua lost to Ruiz and then Wilder lost to Fury. Uh, so it can change dramatically uh, quite quickly. And a heartbeat. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I tell you what, just while we're talking about things changing fast, I honestly think that uh, Dillian White's got his hands full with Otto Wallen. I think that this is, you know, this is a dangerous fight. This is a guy who won some rounds against Tyson Fury. You know, this is a guy that looked great against Brazil. Um, this is a guy that you know destroyed Travis Kaufman, who was a tough guy who went the distance with uh, Ortiz. You know, I think I think Wallen's ready for a big upset here, and we all know that you know with it, you know to Dillian's credit, he he doesn't dodge anyone. He's put his hand up to fight everyone, but really, if you if you if you break down, if you go right back for the last four years and you really you, you you look at the names but then you break down those fights and you look at the Parker fight where Joe had a mouth in the last round you look at the fact that he headbutted them in the cerebellum there was controversy there you look at the Chisora fight after that where he knocked Chisora out in the 11th round but two of the three judges had Chisora winning the fight you look at the Oscar Rebus fight where he was dropped by Oscar Rebus and went went 12 rounds the Maurice Wok fight where he looked horrible. The fight after that, he got knocked out by Povetkin, came back course to knock Povetkin out. Now he's fighting Otto Wallen. Look, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. I think Otto Wallen is getting Dillian White at the right time. And this is a fight that I think they're really gambling, uh, fighting a you know big six foot, five and a half Southpaw who can box. I'm actually speaking to Otto immediately after you, Kev, this in a couple of hours' time. So really? I am indeed. Tell him yeah. I think he's got, hey, I think it's a it's a fight that's very, very winnable for him. Yeah. But but in the in in when we talk about Dylan White, I know he's he is desperate to get that world title shot. Now we know And he deserves it more than absolutely. anyone else in the heavyweight division. I'll give him all props here. He does deserve it. 
but but well, you know, as I said before, if you dissect the last six opponents, there is there are times there. There's little factors in all of those fights. Sure, he comes through, but by God, you know his luck is due to run out. But if you if you look at obviously Usyk AJ next week, if if Usyk wins, then there's going to be a rematch. With Fury Wilder, however that result goes, the WBC still haven't announced who the number one is for the division. So, Diddin's not getting any younger. He, he could potentially be waiting another year before he gets the title shot. So, he wants to test himself with the, with the best and and take those risky fights like he's done. Um, is that better than obviously him fighting people who are just not going to do anything to his resume or or improve him as a fighter? No, look, I just hope that a lot of other people actually realize that the Otto Wallen fight's a real fight. You know, I don't know the way, I don't know how Wallen is um, considered in the UK. Obviously, people watched him fight Fury and everyone thought that Fury was going to have an easy night with him. And of course, you know, he split his eye open and, and made things very, very difficult. And we know how good of a boxer Tyson is, but he had his hands full that night. It only takes Otto Wallen to have a night like that, and he could really pull off an upset here. Okay, but I want to move on to a former fight of yours, a beloved friend of yours <laughs> now, uh, someone I saw is sitting in your swimming pool a couple of weeks ago, Joseph Parker. <laughs> uh, are you surprised he's taking uh, the rematch with Derek? No, I said to him, it's the only fight for you. Go out there and get that. My God, if that fight's on offer, I said, you got to take it. That was especially like it was always going to be a possible rematch because of the first fight being close. But look, let's remember there's a lot of factors that came into that. It was, you know, Joe's first fight without me. We've been eight, together for eight years. He was having to uproot, go and do a, a training camp. It was only a small one uh, over in Ireland for a start and then the UK. Um, you know, I think that, that Joseph Parker will be a lot better prepared for the for the rematch and then you also look at 2019 joe fought once 2020 he fought once you know this chisora rematch is his third fight for 2021 now the activity has shown in the past that when joe is active he's a very dangerous fighter and and i'm thrilled to see him back in the ring this year no, we look forward to it. Um, Kev, just before I go, before Zoom cuts me off, I just want to get your thoughts. Obviously, last week, a man you know well, a man you shared the ring with um, in, in a sad state last week, 58-year-old Evander Holyfield. <sighs> I, I don't really know how to even ask the question, but what was your... I'm sure you, you saw clips of it, or if not, you watched it live, but what was your reaction? Mate, I was so sad, and I was gutted. And you know, over the years when you and I have talked, when they first started talking about all these guys coming back two or three years ago, I was never, ever a fan. I always spoke against it. You know, look, if, if fighters, it, it's really sad that retired fighters can be preyed on, the very vulnerable, a lot of them. And, uh, you know, people... Pray, pray on that vulnerability. You know, some of these guys need to be protected from themselves. There is no way that a 58-year-old Evander Holyfield, who, by the way, hadn't fought for over a decade, would be allowed or sanctioned to be in the ring fighting. Look, I, hey, I love Evander, but I, I, I felt that there had to be someone like a family member or, or an agent or somebody make that decision for him uh, that's why like uh, i'm you know i applaud dana white for not allowing chuck liddell to saying there is no way i'm gonna let you in that ring you're just not allowed you know someone needs to to save these guys from themselves uh it's 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 embarrassing you ruin your you lose honor you damage your legacy and it's and it's so disrespectful for the sport of boxing. Uh, is, is it gonna? Are we gonna see an incident take place for them to finally realise that we should not be doing this? Is that what it's gonna come to? Kev? Uh, I I I I honestly believe that, and it's only sheer luck that no one's been badly hurt at the moment. It is going to happen, Raz. You know, we need to put 
safety measures in place to protect our champions, our former champions. You know, give them the respect that they deserve. And if they look, if 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 for any reason, if it's financial or with whatever reason, if they go to enter a ring, make it with 16 ounce gloves, make it with head guards, and make sure that the matchings are competitive and make sure they're two minute rounds and there's only four of them or five of them. You know, it's like, you know, for that fight to be scheduled uh, for eight three minute rounds was just wrong on, on all fronts. Wow. And I tell you what, when I talk about applauding, I applauded the Californian Commission for saying, not a friggin' chance that that fight takes place here. We will not sanction that. Okay, uh, Kevin, always always great to to get some wisdom uh, from yourself. Um, we're not going to leave it for months next time. We're going to catch up <laughs> regularly, hopefully. Uh, so make sure you you reply back quite quickly to me, like you always do, and. Uh, Maybe we can catch up after Usyk Joshua as well, just to see what happened. And, and yeah, I'd love to, that. mate. Kevin Barry, IFL TV. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raz, and thanks for having me on IFL TV, brother.